Welcome to the weekend edition of Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that for over 50 years has been changing lives through God's unconditional love and grace. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning. It's the start of knowledge. If you don't have a fear of God, you aren't even to first base yet. And now, here's Andrew. I've been teaching on the fear of God, and I hadn't even got time to go back and verify the things that I was saying. But uh, the first night I talked from uh, Psalms chapter 36, verse 1, that the transgression of the wicked says within my heart there is no fear of God before his eyes. And so I've been teaching on the fear of God and talking about how we need this in our society and in our own personal lives. The people that don't know the Lord personally should not only have a fear, a reverence for God, but they ought to have a dread of God if they don't accept Jesus. There is coming judgment and hell is a real place. And so if they had that, I use this other scripture, Proverbs 16, 6, it says, by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Fear of God, uh, knowing that we are gonna be accountable to God would restrain evil in people who aren't even born again. If they knew that someday they were gonna be accountable, they wouldn't have mass shootings and then shoot themselves thinking that they escaped judgment. They would know that they just ushered themselves into judgment. So uh, anyway, I've talked about those things and there's so much, there's literally hundreds of verses in the Bible about the fear of the Lord. It talks about the fear of the Lord is a key to long life. Did you know you'll live longer if you fear the Lord? And this is talking to believers, if you'll reverence God. Uh, man, there's just so many scriptures. Let me use some here today to make this point. In Psalms 111 verse 10, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. And let me just read these others because they're basically saying the same thing in just a little different way. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning. It's the start of knowledge. If you don't have a fear of God, you aren't even to first base yet. And yet we've got people today who are doctors and heads of these uh, education facilities that they don't have any fear of God and yet they're proclaiming that they are teaching knowledge. It's degenerated to where our institutions are just propaganda machines. Now there may be some ex exceptions to that, but very few. Did you know that Harvard, Yale, Princeton were all started as divinity schools? And they used to, you had to attend the chapel. You had to read the Bible. There was codes of conduct. Nowadays, if you aren't an atheist, when you go to one of those places, the chances are you will be by the time you get out. Statistics show that 70 to 80% of all Christian youth renounce their faith in God after one year of college. That's statistical facts. 70 to 80 percent. Did you know if we were sending people into battle and we knew that 70 to 80 percent were going to die, I guarantee you, you couldn't sustain that. We would change. We'd do something different. And yet Christians are sending their children to these secular colleges that are just indoctrinating people, teaching this critical race theory, woke stuff, all of this stuff that is completely against the Word of God. They're teaching socialism which I mentioned this last night but or yesterday, but socialism is covetousness, which the Bible says covetous, Colossians 3, 5, is idolatry. It's idolatry for you to sit there and covet what somebody else has and say, you've got too much. And so we're going to take from you. We're going to tax the rich and give to the poor. That's a socialist mentality and it's anti-God. Thank you for that thunderous silence. And I'm saying this in love, but there are many of you that have listened to this stuff and you bought into it and think, well, these execs shouldn't be billionaires while there's people over here struggling. I'm not saying that they shouldn't give, but it should be voluntary. It's, you, it's wrong for you to go and take money from somebody else. For Biden to pass all of these things and say, we're going to tax the rich to pay for it. That's wrong. 
It's a disincentive for the rich. You know, we got a lot of money that comes into our ministry and stuff, and people criticize me over that, but we pay for, we pay 735 people's salaries, and we, we're, we're supporting lots of people. And if they go to taxing me, and if they take away our tax exemption, they may sit here and think, well, you shouldn't have this money. It's going to affect every one of our employees. We will lose, well, we won't, because I'm going to believe God regardless of what they do. But I'm saying... It's wrong for you to sit there and say, this person makes too much money. You don't have any right to tell what another person can make or not make. Instead of you pulling people down to your level, you need to raise up to their level. Amen. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And people who don't have any fear of the Lord, people who are saying that they're atheists or agnostics, oh man, Oh, I'll say this, but they're fools. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 14 and 53, it repeats it. The same, same Psalm is repeated. 14 and 53 are the same Psalm with just a couple of words different. And it says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Any person who doesn't believe that there's a God, when heaven is just screaming at them every day, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth His handiwork. Did you know that those words in the Hebrew, it means to score with the mark for ownership. If you had something and you put a mark on it that this is my seal, this is my insignia to show that this is yours, God has put marks on creation. Creation is just shouting at people every day that there's a God. Any person that can see, even excluding the animal life and humans, if you just look at the natural creation and think that this all happened accidentally and that we came from slime, what was it you said, Dwayne, from ooh to the zoo to you? If you believe that that happened, you're dumber than a bag of rocks. I love you. I love you. And I... I was in Chicago and said this and a whole row got up and left. You're free to leave. You, you're free to have your opinion, but I'm not going to agree with you or we'd both be wrong. I'm telling you that God created us and heaven is declaring this. And yet the majority of the people, did you know that in the U.S. Uh, population, there is less, I think it's uh, 5%, I've heard some varying, but 5 to 10% maximum are, call themselves atheist. But did you know in u universities, among the staff, it's 95% are atheist. It is inverted from what the regular thing is, and we are sending our kids there and paying big bucks and going in debt that it takes them 20 and 30 years to pay for this indoctrination. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you ought to send your kids to Karis Bible College. Yeah. Amen. And even if they have to become a doctor or a lawyer or something where they have to go to some secular school, they ought to come and get grounded in biblical worldview so that when they go into this toxic situation, they'd be able to stand. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And if you skip this, anything you learn isn't knowledge. It's propaganda. It's lies. It's deception. I'm preaching better than you're listening. <laughs> Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. There is no wisdom apart from fearing the Lord. God is the source of all wisdom and knowledge, and it starts with Him. You know, I used this verse the other night, but it says, In thy light shall we see light. But the Word of God is light, it says in many different places. And only through understanding what the Word of God reveals about God can we truly understand anything. If you start with a false premise, you're always going to come up with a wrong answer. And our society, the educational system by and large, has rejected God, has no fear of God. And these are the ones that are teaching our children, not only in... Uh, graduate schools, but in our uh, schools, 
critical race theory, all of this stuff. That stuff is a lie. It's a lie. It's contrary to the Word of God. In Proverbs 15, 33, the fear of the Lord is the, is the instruction of wisdom and before honor is humility. Man, the last part of that is amazing. This is contrary to what 99.999% of all of the people believe. They believe that uh, humility is something to be avoided. That's for losers. That's for weak people. But this says before honor is humility. In 1 uh, Peter chapter 5 and also James chapter 4, they're basically the same things written by different authors. But it says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And if you want more favor, it says he gives more grace to those who humble himself. If you want more favor, more grace, you need to operate in humility, which isn't just thinking bad about yourself, thinking low. It's recognizing God, exalting God, and recognizing your place that you are submitted unto Him. A person who is doing their own thing and leaning under their own understanding is a proud person. Pride isn't just arrogance. Pride is dependence upon yourself. Pride is doing things your way. Like Ashley said that the Lord told him, double your giving, and his first thought is, I'm not hearing you. See, that's pride. Of course, Ashley submitted. And he, he's just sharing with you his first thought. But Ashley's heart is submitted to God. But when, you, when God tells you to do this and you say, but God, I need to do this, that's pride. You're dependent upon yourself. You're exalting your wisdom. You're making yourself God. I can't even understand. I can't relate to people who come up to me and say, God told them to do this, but... I had a guy from Chicago that came to my office in Colorado Springs. And he says, God told me to come to Karis Bible College, but... And then he said his parents, when he told them about it, they said, we've never heard of this Andrew Womack. So they went to their pastor and asked, and he said, oh, that guy's a cult. Stay away from him. And so the parents said, no, you can't go. And he was working for his parents, and he was going to inherit the business from them. And they said, if you go to that place, we'll disinherit you and you don't have any inheritance coming. Plus, he was engaged and his girlfriend went to that same church and she said, if you go to that school, I'll cancel the engagement. I won't marry you. So he stood to lose his parents, lose his inheritance, lose his prospective wife. And he says, God told me, but... And he told me all this. And so after this, he says... So what do you think I should do? And I said, you lost me the moment you said God told you. <laughs> I said, if God told you, do it. And he says, but what about all this? I said, who cares about all that? <laughs> do you know, there are many of you right here that I can guarantee you, if you knew God told you to do something, but it was going to cost you your family, it was going to cost you your inheritance, it was going to cost you your potential mate, there's many of you that wouldn't do it. You know why? Because you fear people. You fear failure. You fear poverty more than you fear God. You probably wouldn't call that pride, but that's what that is. You're going to exalt yourself. You're going to promote yourself at all expense. Before honor is humility. Look at this in Psalms 119, 99. And, and 100, both of these verses, Psalms 119, 99, and verse 100. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. And then more, verse 100, I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. If this is true, which it is true, then to go to some place that completely ridicules faith and the Bible and godly principles and submit to them. You aren't getting smarter. You're getting dumber. You have more understanding than all of your teachers when you meditate in the Word of God day and night. And you understand more than the ancients because you keep God's precepts. Man, that's awesome. I'm telling you, the Word of God will make you look good. Without me going into a lot of detail on this, you know, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I'm a college dropout. 
Um, one of the reasons we aren't um, accredited, we do have accreditation, but we're accredited by a group that has like, uh, I don't know, 2,000 schools it's accredited, but it's not recognized by the secular people. And in our local newspaper, I just had an article come out about me last week about that we are unaccredited and people need to stay away from us and they're criticizing all that. But one of the reasons I'm unaccredited is because you have to have people with degrees to teach in your school. I wouldn't even be able to teach in my own school if I was accredited. Plus, you have to do all of these things and you have to learn their woke philosophy and I'm not going to do it. I don't care about that stuff. I'm guaranteeing you, the people that come out of our Bible college know the Word of God. They don't know everything, but they've got a good foundation and it makes a difference and makes them wiser than all of their teachers and understanding more than the ancients. And so anyway, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer and I haven't done everything right. Uh, Billy Epperhart, we just held a business summit and we had John Maxwell there, one of the most influential men in the world. And um, anyway, the teaching that they gave, it was all good. I loved it. I actually took notes, which I don't normally take notes, but I was impressed. I took notes, but I haven't done a thing that they teach. <laughs> I don't set goals. I don't discipline my, I don't do any of this stuff. But you know, the one thing I do, I love God and I keep my nose in the Word of God. And just like these verses, God has told me what to do and it makes me look good. It makes me look smart. I'm really not that smart, but you know what? I, have, I can hear God and when I obey God, everything I touch just turns to gold. I'm blessed. You know, I looked at my reports this morning and we are $8.749 million ahead of where we were last year. And last year was the biggest income we've ever had. Our calls are up 75,000 more calls than we had last year. And last year was 88,000 for the entire year, 88,000 above the previous year. We're going to have close to 1 million contacts this year. Everything I'm doing is just blessed, 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 not because of me and my smartness, but because I meditate in the Word of God and God's Word. He will tell you what to do. He'll make you look good. If you put half as much effort into the Word of God as you do into all of your other stuff that we occupy ourselves with, I guarantee you, you'd begin to prosper supernaturally. Amen? So let me illustrate this to you. I want to use the book of Daniel, Daniel and his three friends. It says here in Daniel chapter 1, it says in verse 5, and the king appointed them. This is talking about Daniel and his three friends. Let me just set this up by saying that Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem four times. You know, it's sometimes hard to understand this. And if you just read scripture without really studying this, uh, it could be confusing because he conquered Jerusalem and then put one of the kings in place and that king rebelled and he conquered Jerusalem four times before he finally took all these people captive. Uh, I, in my living commentary, it took me one week to write one note on that. Daniel chapter one, verse two, and it would explain all of that. You ought to get that living commentary. It's awesome. And anyway, it says here that uh, these uh, four people, Daniel and his three friends were taken captive and it says that they were made eunuchs. <laughs> so get this picture. They had been conquered by a foreign country. Probably their families were killed. If not their families were killed, certainly their friends or many of their friends' families were killed in conquering Jerusalem. They took these four guys and made them eunuchs. If somebody was to do that to me, I might have a problem with that. <laughs> They were made eunuchs and then they were put in this situation. And yet you see Daniel and his three friends loving God, serving God, not having a bad attitude. 
Again, our society has gotten so far away from the Word of God that if somebody just does something a little bit wrong, you feel justified in just having a temper tantrum and going out and causing a riot and burning things and looting and doing stuff because somebody did you wrong. These people had been done wrong more than anybody you know, plus they'd castrated all of these guys. And yet in this situation, look at Daniel and his three friends. It says in verse five, it says, and the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank to nourish them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of uh, Meshach, and to uh, Azariah of Abednego. You know what they were doing? They were trying to change their identity. They had been conquered, they had been taken to a foreign land, and they took the ones it says up here earlier that they had no uh, blemish in them. They were uh, handsome people, they were physically strong, they were smart and everything, and they were going to re-educate them in the Babylonian system and use them uh, to prosper Babylon. And so they were trying to change their identity, to get rid of their Jewishness. And they changed their names. I guarantee you, this is what our society is trying to do with us, to get rid of our Christian heritage in this nation, to get rid of the morality that was established upon Christian principles. And it says uh, in verse 8, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. And the eunuch, uh, prince of the eunuchs went on to say, but you know, you'll look sickly and poor and the king will come and I'll be persecuted for it. And Daniel said, you just try us. You give us pulse to eat and then you come and check us. And when he checked them, they looked better and fatter and, and healthier than the other people. And so they allowed them to do it. There, people often use this to promote some kind of a diet that you need to be a vegetarian. And anyway, I'm not going to go there, but I don't think it, it might have included some of that, but this was about them defiling themselves with meat that had been strangled and blood was in the meat. It violated the Jewish kosher stuff. It wasn't really about whether it was meat or pulse or stuff like this. It was about violating the laws of God. They feared God and they were willing to put their life on the line and they were not going to give up their Jewish roots. They weren't going to give up their Jewish names uh, Daniel, as he writes this, he refers to these other three friends as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but he always calls himself Daniel in this thing. They kept their identity, and this was them fearing God and putting God first and refusing to give up their identity in God. And so anyway, after they had done all of this, and after I think it was three years they had been taught the Babylonian language, they were brought in before Nebuchadnezzar, and he gave them questions to check them out and see how they had done. And look at this in the first chapter, in verse 19, it says, And the king communed with them, and among them, this is talking about all of the people that he had done this to, not just these four, but all of the people from all of the nations, he communed with them, and among them was none found like unto Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all the realm. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. Most people believe that Daniel lasted through three different kingdoms, probably 60 years because of the favor and the blessing that God put upon him. But just like these verses I was reading, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of knowledge. And because they put God first and kept their mind stayed upon him, they were 10 times better than anybody else. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, this is where we should be. We should be fearing God and exalting God's Word and standing on what God says and standing against this stuff that's going on in our society. If you haven't noticed, 
Man, you'd have to be blind and deaf to not notice. But our society has lost its ever-loving mind <laughs> to where people can't even figure out which restroom to go into. <laughs> Did you know that science teaches, science teaches that every person has either two Y chromosomes or an X and a Y chromosome. Women have two Y chromosomes. Men have an X and a Y chromosome. Is that right? And so on a cellular level, every cell in your body is either male or female. And it doesn't matter what you feel like. I don't care how you feel. I don't care how messed up your thinking is. Every cell in your body is either male or female. Andrew's complete teaching, The Fear of the Lord, is available in a DVD album made from our daily television broadcast or as a CD or DVD album recorded live at a ministry event. I'd like to encourage you to get this product that we're offering on the fear of the Lord. This is taken from my TV programs and then I taught it in a live conference and this is DVDs from that conference and also CDs. So there's three different ways that you can get this. But the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil and it's the beginning of wisdom. And we need the fear of the Lord today. So listen to our announcer and please request these products today. Go to awmi.net to see all the ways you can get these products. You can also order resources or receive prayer by calling our helpline at 719-635-1111. Our helpline is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. You are, and I don't care what you say, you are and will ever be a male or a female in this life. In heaven, we don't have that, I don't think. We aren't given in marriage and stuff. I don't know all of that. But anyway, in this life, in this life, you are a male or a female. That is so basic, and science proves it. And yet people today are so screwed up in their thinking that they can't figure this out. They can't figure out that two women can't have a baby. And two men can't have a baby. That's dumb to the second power. That's dumb, dumb. I love you. <laughs> Man, Dwayne's going to come smooth all this over. He'll be nicer than I am. But I'm telling you that how dumb can you get and still breathe? People are crazy today. And Christians are listening to this and listening to all of this stuff being pumped at us and it's taken away the fear of God. You need to fear God. Man, I've, this is wrong. I need more time. <laughs> Let me turn over here to, to Daniel chapter 3 and I just want to illustrate the fear of God. They don't use that terminology right here, but this is what it is. You know, the fear of God is used hundreds of times in the Bible, but there's hundreds, maybe thousands of times it's illustrated without using those words. And here in Daniel chapter 3 is where Nebuchadnezzar got so lifted up with pride, he made this huge statue out of gold of himself and proclaimed that everybody had to bow down and worship it. Everybody's got to wear a mask. Everybody's got to get vaccinated. We still have the same thing happening today. And if you don't do it, you're going to be thrown into a vaccination uh, colony. Did you know that they're doing that in Australia? I just read that today, that they are taking children, 24,000 children. Parents will not be allowed in there and they're going to vaccinate them and they've got the police standing there to keep the parents from doing it. Man, that's terrible. So anyway, he said, when you hear the music, you've got to bow down. And if you don't, you're going to be thrown into a burning, fiery furnace. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were three of the leaders in government because they had honored God and God had promoted them. And so when the music played, there was thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people that all fell on their face and followed the king's command. And I guarantee you, those people knew that that idol wasn't God. 
but they were fearful of the king. And so whatever the government says, you just bow down and obey. And they didn't have a constitution that guaranteed them rights. Man, we, there's no excuse for us just falling in lockstep and, let, and letting them lead us like lambs to the slaughter. But anyway, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they stood standing. And because of it, the king brought them in front of him and he says, if when you hear the music, you'll bow down, I'll let you live. But if you don't, you're going to be thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. And look at this in Daniel 3, 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. In other words, we aren't afraid of you. We don't have to give an answer to you. I don't care what you do. Look at this next verse. It says, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. I believe that they believed God was going to protect them. But the next verse says, But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Man, that's awesome. These people feared God and honored God, and they said, King, you're a nobody. <laughs> he ruled the world. Nebuchadnezzar was the most, uh, the, the most powerful man that had ever lived in history up to this point. And they said, we aren't careful to answer you. We aren't afraid of you. Our God is able to deliver us from you. But even if he doesn't, be it known that we aren't going to bow down and worship your image. There's a lot of people that if they were guaranteed that God would protect you and that everything would work out, well, then maybe you'd stand up if you had a guarantee that it was going to work. But you know what? There's a lot of people that like when Steve stood up and everybody turned against him and critic. I guarantee you that there was a temptation. I hadn't talked to him, but because he's human, he probably had a temptation to think, man, I don't like this. And to think maybe I'll change. But praise God, he stood strong. There's a lot of people that will stand as long as they're guaranteed that it's going to work. But you know, we aren't guaranteed that we're always going to win. When I made my stand and sued the government, the government sued me and sent the police after us with cease and desist orders and things. When, when that happened, I guarantee you, I thought, man, do I want this? No, I don't want it. But you know what? It didn't matter whether it worked out, whether they put me in jail, whatever they did, I was going to stand and do what God told me to do. I had a woman come up to me today and she says, you know, the other night when you were talking, I've never made that decision that I'm going to serve God regardless. And she says, I can see the benefit of doing that because you don't have to debate it. And once you get into a deal, you've already determined, you've already settled it. And man, she said it had just set her free. Most people have not determined that they are going to stick with God come hell or high water, whether it cost you your life, whether it cost you your family, whether it cost you anything, you are going to serve God. And because of that, when you come into a crisis, then you've got conflict because you've got to make a decision. I've already made my decision. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had already made their decision. And they said, our God is able to deliver us. We believe He will deliver us, but even if He doesn't, I'm not going to serve you. You know what that is? That's fearing God in action. There are many of you in here that know enough of the Word of God that you know many of the things being pushed on you are not right you know it's not right. You know they don't have the constitutional right. And yet, you wouldn't stand up. I'm saying this in love. I'm not critical of you, but I'm saying you fear men more than you fear God. I had a woman come to me that they were going to force her to get vaccinated to continue to be a nurse. And she says, what am I going to do? And I said, well, I said, do you think you should get the vaccination? And I'm not against people who do. If you've got the vaccination, that's your choice. You can do whatever you want. I'm not against you, but I'm saying forcing people to do it is wrong. And they do not have the right to do that. And so I asked her, I said, what do you feel you need to do? And she says, I don't want, I believe that it's, she's a nurse. And she says, I believe it's dangerous. I'm not taking this vaccination. And, uh, 
I said, do you believe that's what God wants you to do? And she said, yes. And I said, well, then do it. And she says, but what, look what could happen. I could lose my job. And I said, do what God tells you to do. And either they will want to keep you enough that they will change and you will help other people that didn't have the guts to stand up. Or if you lose your job, God will give you something better. But I said... I never determine God's will based on what I think the outcome will be. I can't even imagine living that way. I may be one of the few in this room that thinks this way. But most people, it's, it's debatable. What's going to happen to me? And that promoting you and protecting you is paramount in your life. I'm saying this in love, brothers and sisters. I don't know any better way to say it, but that's idolatry. You love yourself more than you love God. You love yourself more than you love people. You love yourself more than you love what's right. And so you're going you're gonna to do whatever is best for self, regardless if it's wrong, if you have to lie, if you have to compromise, if you have to do something wrong, I'm going to take care of me. Man, that's a terrible way to live. There's things that are more important than you. You know, if you live 80 years here on this planet, that's just like the snap of a finger to eternity. You're going to live in eternity forever. And if you compromise down here to prolong this brief life, and if you make that your focus and your priority, you'll regret it throughout all eternity. Now, God is going to come and wipe away all tears from our eyes, but I don't believe that's because we all limp into heaven and we just get there and we're, we're so miserably as to wipe tears from our eyes. I believe it's when we get to heaven and we know all things and we see how awesome God was and we see how weird all of this was and how we were intimidated and how we stayed sick when you could have been well and you were poor when you could have been rich. I think that Christians are going to be crying and he's going to have to come wipe away tears when we all of a sudden know all things and realize how sub standard we lived when we had everything of God on the inside of us. Man, you, you're short-term thinking. Well, I could lose my job. Who cares? I can guarantee you if something happened to me and if I lost this ministry, I'd go to McDonald's and I'd be the best worker they ever had. I would, I would manage that thing and I'd start owning a string of McDonald's in a short period of time. I'm like cream. I rise to the top because God's blessing is on me. I'm like a cork. You can take me to the bottom of the lake and I'll rise again because God's blessing is on me. God is my source, not my job, not all of these other things. You know, when they came out with these restrictions, they, they closed everything and did all of this stuff. And uh, they had this, I forgot what they call it, but anyway, they'd give you money uh, to pay your employees and stuff. And uh, my staff came to me, do you want us to do this? And I said, no, I'm not taking any money from the government. They aren't gaining an inroad to me so that they can tell me what to do. God's my source. And I'm not letting the government pay me anything. It turned out later that if you have over 500 employees, you didn't qualify. But my staff even came to me and said, we've got Karis and then we've got AWM. We could divide those two. This is what Planned Parenthood did. They have tens of thousands of employees, but they only have 40 or 50 employees in one place. So they divided them all up and they took billions of dollars into Planned Parenthood because they got a technicality, it's illegal. They should be thrown in jail for that. But anyway, we could have separated AWM and we could have separated CBC and we could have qualified, but I wasn't going to do that. God is my source and not somebody else. Man, forgive me for even starting on this and not able to finish it. But you know what? They, they just said, we aren't afraid of you. Do whatever. And so he, it says Nebuchadnezzar, his, the visage 
of his face changed. That's talking about his face, facial expressions. I believe the devil rose up in this guy. That somebody, how dare they say that God is more powerful than I am. I'll show them. And he heated the furnace seven times hotter. How hot do you have to get a fire to kill a person? <laughs> this was irrational. Did you know much of the stuff that they're doing in this nation? It's totally irrational. Get vaccinated and then wear two masks. <laughs> get vaccinated and then... 50% of the people that get vaccinated get the virus. What's the point? It's totally illogical and to stay six feet apart and I'm not, you know, you can do whatever you want to, but I tell you what, that's just crazy. And then you touch the same door handle that all the other unvaccinated people did and you're doing, it's just crazy. It's crazy. And anyway, he heated the furnace seven times hotter and he took his mightiest men and they wrapped themselves in all of their clothes and the fire was so hot it killed them. They burned up. He killed some of his mightiest warriors in his whole thing to just punish these three guys. And they threw them into the fire and they were bound when they entered the fire. But when they got into the fire, all of their bonds were loosed. Did you know when you take a stand for what's right, when you fear God more than you fear man, I guarantee you, it'll set you free from the worry of all of these people living in fear of people is bondage. Our forefathers says that I would, uh, an American would rather die on his feet than live on his knees. That's the attitude that caused this great nation to come into being. And yet our, their descendants are sitting there willing to live on their knees rather than sit there and take a stand. You fear men more than you fear God. And Nebuchadnezzar looked into the fire. Apparently he was up looking down into it and he saw four men, not three, but four. And the fourth one was like the son of God. And they walked around in the fire and they weren't burnt and they didn't even have a smell of smoke on them. Everybody wants this kind of a testimony. Man, we want to testify about what God has done, but nobody's willing to take a stand when you don't know what the outcome's going to be. And I wish to add time, but over in the sixth chapter, the first one through three, it says that Daniel was promoted and he was exalted and Darius thought to make him ruler over the whole realm because he had more wisdom than all of the ancients, more wisdom than all of his instructors because he feared God more than he feared men. And the other people became jealous. They put out this law. They tricked Darius into saying that nobody could pray to any God or ask a petition of any God for 30 days except for Darius. And Darius signed it. And it says, after he saw the writing and knew the command, he prayed as he did every day with his windows open towards Jerusalem. Did you know he could have closed his windows? He could have prayed in private. This is civil disobedience. He intentionally did it in a way that put him in the crosshairs of that command because he feared God more than he feared man. And he didn't do it in secret. You don't have to pray publicly. You don't have to open the windows. You don't have to let everybody see what you're doing, but he did it publicly. He stood up because he feared God. And of course, you know, the story goes on that, that he was thrown into the lion's den and God protected him and he lived. And the people who threw him in there, they were thrown in and they were devoured before they even hit the ground. The lions were so hungry. God supernaturally protected him. And Daniel went through three different kingdoms and outlasted them all. And God prospered him because he feared God. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, the fear of man brings a snare. It's a terrible way to live, worrying about whether you're going to be punished, criticized, whether somebody's going to roll their eyes at you if you stand for what's true. You need to get to a place to where you love God so much that you really don't care. I had a person come to me one time and walk down the aisle and he just started criticizing me and saying all kinds of things against me. 
And I just stopped him right in the middle of it. And I said, who died and made you God? And he looked at me and says, what are you saying? I said, you aren't God. I don't care what you think. God loves me. I said, I don't do everything right, but God loves me and I'm growing. And, and I said, I just don't care. He, well, you should. And I said, I don't. I said, compared to God, you're nobody. I said, you're a nobody. We met with our officials in 2020 before one of our conferences because they were trying to close us down. And I said, no, we are going to have this conference. And we met with them and they were, they, one of them says, you have no integrity. You're, you're a liar. And just, they, they blasted me with all kinds of things. And, and I sat there and let them criticize me. And finally, I told this one commissioner who was just ragging on me. I said, look, I've been criticized by a lot more important people than you. <laughs> And I said, I don't care what you think. <laughs> People think that's arrogance. It's not arrogance. It's just that I love God so much that compared to God, you're nobody. Compared to God, the Supreme Court, the president, anybody else is nobody. And I'm going to honor God and fear God. And because of that, God has blessed me. I believe he'll continue to bless me. But you know what? If he didn't, if he didn't deliver me and if they came and got everything I've got, I'm going to do what's right because I'm going to spend eternity with God in heaven and I'm not going to regret the decisions I make because of short-term thinking. Man, we need to honor God. Amen. Thank you for watching the weekend edition of Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack. We hope you've been blessed by today's teaching. You can get the products on today's teaching as well as many other valuable resources when you visit our website at awmi.net. For over 20 years, Karis Bible College has been training and empowering students to know who they are in Christ and step into their God-given calling and purpose. Not only do we have our main campus in Woodland Park, Colorado, we also have extension schools in several locations all around the world. You can also participate in Keras Online through our distance education courses. If you're interested in attending Keras Bible College, visit kerasbiblecollege.org to find a campus near you to discover all the ways you can attend Keras Bible College. Andrew Womack Ministries has several offices in Keras Bible College locations around the world. To find a location near you, visit our website at awmi.net and click Contact Us. We want to say a special thank you to the Grace Partners of Andrew Womack Ministries. Your gifts make it possible to put free ministry materials into the hands of many people in need. If you're not already a Grace Partner, we ask you to pray about becoming one today. You can become a Grace Partner or order resources through our website at awmi.net. You can also order resources or receive prayer by calling our helpline at 719-635-1111. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. Did you know Andrew Womack Ministries is on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and Pinterest? Follow Andrew on social media today. Through Andrew Womack Ministries, countless destinies have been changed. Bodies have been healed, marriages restored, and minds transformed around the world. What has made a difference in so many lives started, though, with one ordinary 12-year-old who asked God to show him his will for his life at his father's funeral. This is the destiny story of Andrew Womack. I was sitting on the front row, and this is when they had an open casket, and I was sitting there looking at the, my dad's body and listening to that song, How Great Thou Art, and I just thought, this is weird. I was told that God's the one that killed my dad when I was 12 years old, that God punished us, that God put sickness on us. He, he was, you know, extremely hard to please, and if you didn't measure up, boy, you could expect the wrath of God. And I remember at that funeral praying and saying, God, if you're truly great, Reveal yourself to me. Show me what you want to do with my life. 
God did exactly that. On March 23, 1968, God revealed himself to 18-year-old Andrew, freeing him from his religious mindset that was based on his own performance. I was just laying on the floor in a puddle of tears, and instead of God's wrath coming on me, I just had a supernatural, a tangible love come on me that uh, overwhelmed me. Because of that experience, that God's goodness to me and love for me has nothing to do with how good I am. It just transformed me. From the beginning, I just knew it was going to touch the world. I got drafted and sent to Vietnam, and I was put out on a fire support base. But did you know I was a chaplain's assistant assigned there, and my chaplain was gone. And so I actually didn't have anybody over me. I didn't have anything to do. And I sat there for 13 months, spending anywhere from 10 to 15 hours a day just studying the Word. My very first day in Vietnam, I was reading in Mark chapter 4 about, you know, that the uh, mustard seed is the least of all seeds, but when it's sown in the earth, it becomes this huge tree. And the birds, the fowls of the air come and lodge in the branches there. I said, God, that's what I want. I want this worldwide ministry. And God told me that your root is only that deep. You can't afford it. He says, you just forget about all of the fruit and you just deal with the root. And that became a direction for me all through Vietnam. Andrew survived Vietnam through the Word. Upon returning home, Andrew married his childhood friend, Jamie. For 20 years, Andrew ministered, letting his roots grow deep. But things were not easy. Andrew's commitment to some wrong beliefs caused the couple to go through poverty and frustration. During this time, God spoke to Andrew to start a Bible college, which he did, despite his reservations. I didn't want a Bible college, but I was over in England, 1992. And I mean, just all of a sudden, I saw it. God showed me the person that he wanted to run it. He showed me the very first instructor I ever went and got. Andrew was experiencing some success, but everything he was doing was still not enough to reach the world. Andrew was thinking too small, limiting God to only radio, when God had something else in mind. I was really frustrated because I had this vision of reaching the world. And at the pace I was going, it just wasn't happening. Overall, over 20 years, we did improve. It was just a constant frustration. And one of the keys was in 1998, I was praying about this. And once again, I was saying, God, how do I increase? How do I reach people? And I sat down with a calendar and I got to thinking, if it took me 20 years, to reach 120 radio stations, for me to reach 6,000 radio stations, it just dawned on my lightning fast mind that I wouldn't get there in my lifetime. And I started praying and saying, God, what is going on? I had a dream and I woke up, I think it was three o'clock or 3.30 in the morning. And I mean, I just, it was like somebody shouted out, I heard your time has come. And I sat straight up in bed and it woke me up and I went into my study and I began to start saying, God, what does this mean? And as I prayed about it, he told me, he says, when you start on television, that's gonna be the beginning of your ministry. And if you had died before I went on television, that even though you know I saw people's lives touched and good things happen, he says, you would have missed my perfect will for your life. And that's when the Lord spoke to me and he says, I want you to go on television now. Welcome to the Gospel Truth Broadcast. And today you are going to hear one of the most amazing testimonies that I believe you've ever heard. So stay tuned and prepare to be blessed. Andrew had discovered God's will for his life and was reaching more people than ever before. The increase in the TV audience brought in even more students to the Bible College. And before long, it was more than the ministry could handle. Andrew realized he was still thinking too small. I was talking to a fellow minister about 12 o'clock midnight on January the 31st, and the Lord just spoke to me, Psalm 78, 41, that in your heart you've turned back and you've limited the Holy One of Israel. 
and he showed me how I was limiting him by my small thinking. And the very next day, I got up in front of a group of ministers, my peers, and told them, I started saying, I am gonna have a worldwide ministry that's gonna reach people all over this world. And as I was saying it, I was wondering about, are they gonna think you're arrogant? Are they gonna think you're bragging or something? But I just knew that I had to start uh, speaking forth my vision and quit limiting God. As the Lord showed me I'd been limiting Him, I just started dreaming big, and we went from 14,700 square feet to 110,000 square feet. At that same time, the Lord told me to do it debt-free. It was either we were gonna move to a whole new level and God was gonna supply a miracle, or I was gonna totally kill the ministry. And within 14 months, we had that $3.2 million, and we were in this building. When Andrew took the limits off, the ministry went to the next level. TV viewership increased, and Andrew realized Karis would need more than just a building, but an entire campus. Andrew had a choice to make. He could fully trust God with a dream he was given at 18 years old, or he could keep limiting God, and it would never come to pass. I'm gonna do this with all of the ability that I have, but I've made a decision not to go in debt. Well, here we are at our new property in the sanctuary, and I am thrilled to announce to you that we are actually working on the site. It's crunch time for me. In the next two or three weeks, I need $3 million. <laughs> Well, today is December the 26th, 2013, and this is our very last update. We actually got in here debt-free, and we met our goal, which is a praise the Lord. You gotta understand, this building, look at it, was stuck in the warehouse of faith, waiting for somebody to pull it out. This was not seen at one time. But you couldn't tell Andrew Womack that. When Andrew committed to taking the limits off, the dream God gave him to have a worldwide ministry came to pass. Andrew's roots have gone deep, so now others can receive the fruit. Andrew has discovered his destiny, and now others are discovering theirs through Karis Bible College. What Andrew was once reluctant to start is now producing indescribable fruit. The dream God gave Andrew to reach the world was bigger than he could even imagine. Through discipleship at Karis, an army is being raised up that will continue reaching the world indefinitely with the gospel, as far and as deep as possible. But as Karis Bible College has gotten started and started gaining traction, really the whole focus of my ministry has changed to where now I, I have more joy in seeing people I've ministered to go out and minister than me doing it. All of this is a result of one 12-year-old boy asking God what his will for his life was and reaching it when he took the limits off. If God can accomplish all this from a single seed, imagine what the future holds.